have been expressed Lord this morning and I just want to also thank you so much Lord for your grace to us your mercy your love and your patience with us Lord throughout this year dear God I just pray that you would be in the words of this sermon Lord in the preaching that comes forth from this uh, book that Lord that just that God would be honoured that Christ would be honoured that, that your name would be glorified this morning. Lord, help us to open our hearts, Lord, and our ears this morning to hear what the Spirit has to say to us. Lord, I pray that you would lead us into all the truth this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, good morning. Um, normally what I do on a New Year's Eve is kind of look back over the year and just, you know, give a kind of review of, of what's happened and, and, and what we've done as a church and, you know, a few personal reflections and so on. I, I didn't feel that that's really where the Spirit of God wanted me to go this morning and so I'm not going to do that. Um, and what we're going to look at is uh, a really important subject, and this is where I feel the Lord wanted me to, to take you this morning, and that is the subject of Christian spirituality. So if you have a Bible with you, please follow me, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to be looking at, and I'm going to start reading at verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Isn't that interesting? The natural man can't know the things of God, because they are spiritually discerned. You can't teach them to him through regular methods, because these, these things of God are to be spiritually discerned. Discern. You have to have the Spirit of God to truly understand them. Um, before I became a Christian, I was I was always interested in spiritual things. Uh, I've never been an atheist. Uh, I've always felt there was something more beyond this world. Uh, so I was always interested in, in spiritual things, in the supernatural. Uh, I, when I was about 12 or 13, I became interested in the occult and in witchcraft. And, and so I made quite a deep study of that. Uh, as, I, as I reached sort of my mid to late teens, I became interested in um, Eastern, Eastern sort of mysticism and, uh, and, and, and Middle Eastern uh, religions and so on. Um, uh, transcendental meditation and so on. So I looked into all these different spiritual aspects and really explored them uh, quite thoroughly. And, and a lot of people have said to me, well, if you were interested in spiritual things, why did you never go to a church? You know, why, why didn't you just go into a church? Or why didn't you uh, read the Bible if you were so interested in spiritual things? And I think that's a fair question. And throughout the course of this morning, as a sort of a testimony, I want, I want to really tell you at least two conscious reasons why I think I didn't do that, why I didn't go down that road. Now I say conscious because I think there were probably a number of subconscious reasons why I didn't want to give up my sin, uh, uh, you know, uh, Satan had blinded the eyes of my mind. Uh, I was deceived and so on. So there's a number of things going on subconsciously, but there were conscious reasons why I didn't just step out once in the morning and go to my local church and say, tell me all about uh, Christ. 
And, and this is probably going to be difficult for some of you to hear, but I really think it's important that we hear this. Because this is the perspective as, of me as a sort of 17, 18 year old, unchurched, unrepentant, unbelieving uh, uh, person in search of something spiritual. Okay, and so whilst I'm not going to use the sort of flowery language I would have used, uh, I, I will give you something of the depth of feeling that I had about this. All right. So why did I not just go to a church? Well, I've been to a number of churches. Admittedly, a limited experience. We weren't a church-going family. You know, I wasn't brought up as a Christian. But my experience had been weddings, christenings, you know, that kind of thing. And I was absolutely stunned by how tedious it really was. You know, you can go into this cold, drafty building, uh, you have to sit there motionless. And, and, you know, what I took from this was, you know, boring music, boring teaching, boring people. And that, that was the impression. As I say, this is just me being honest. Is that okay this morning? Can I just give it to you straight this morning? This is the impression it made upon me as a teenager. This is terrible. This is awful. This is, why would anybody? How bad does your life have to get that you would spend every Sunday coming here, doing this? You know, and I would have said to them, look, whilst you've still got time, go and get a life before you're too old and infirm to enjoy it. You know, a, 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 a congregation of like, you know, half a dozen elderly ladies in hats. And, and even they can't stay awake during the 10 minute sermonette, you know, preached apologetically, uh, insipidly by a minister. And then, and then they, they, they come up to you after the same would you be joining us for even song, whatever that is? You know, and, and my answer at the time, if I'd been able to just express how I felt, I would have said, you know, I would rather disembowel myself with a rusty spoon than come and sit and listen to more of what I've experienced today. Why? Because I knew there is absolutely no danger of anything spiritual, anything supernatural, anything out of the ordinary happening. Here. It's more akin to a school assembly than a meeting of spiritual minds. So that is reason one why I never went to a church to check out a spirituality or Christianity. Reason two, and this is probably just as hard to hear, if not harder. Reason two is every professing Christian that I had ever met up to that point in my life. All the Christians that I'd met at school, all the Christians that I'd met at college, every single one of them, ungracious, unforgiving, materialistic, selfish, openly hypocritical. Oh, don't look at me, just look at Jesus. And I'm like, no, I'm looking at you because you say that God's Spirit has come into your life and changed you. So I'm looking at you, I'm looking at what you do. And I see somebody who's just like me. I see somebody who swears like I do. I see somebody who's as selfish as I am. I see somebody who's as unclean as I am. I see somebody uh, as disloyal as I am. The difference is I'm not a hypocrite. I, I'm honest. I say that I'm a sinner. I say that I'm a failure. I say that I'm not trying to follow Jesus, but you say you are. So why would I want to be anything like you. I want the real thing. I want real spirituality. If there's a God, I want Him. I want to know Him. And you're not showing me anything of God. You're not showing me anything spiritual. So that is why I did not want anything to do with the church. But everything changed when I was apprehended by the Spirit of God Himself. Now let me say, don't misunderstand me here. It could have been a church of 150 people. It could have been, you know, 
slick presentation, uh, you know, a rock band on the, on the podium and, and uh, you know, dry ice and flashing lights and all that kind of stuff, it would still not have impressed me. Because all that is, that's just good advertising, isn't it? That's just slick presentation. It's not spirituality. In fact, I'd say that the you know, churches that have dry eyes, flashing lights, glory clouds, you know, you have those things because you haven't got the Holy Spirit. Yeah, what, what you need is the Word of God and somebody who is filled with the Spirit to preach it. And that's all you need. Now, I'm not saying there's no anything wrong with advertising your church and, and doing things professionally and competently. But that is not spirituality. What changed everything was the Spirit of God apprehending me. And then I saw, then I saw, this is real. This is real. This is not just, uh, you know, drafty buildings uh, with, with, with some kind of program that you're going through. And, and, and you know, there's something far more here. There's a, there's a spirituality um, about this. And, and I, I don't want to miss, uh, I don't want to miss this, this, Spirituality. What do I mean by spiritual, by the way? When I say spiritual, the, the, I'll give you the dictionary definition. You probably can't see that that clearly, even I can't see that that clearly, but uh, the dictionary definition is, is so for something spiritual is that which is relating to or affecting the human spirit or soul as opposed to material or physical things. Now we've talked about the, the danger of duality and sort of saying, oh, well, here's all my spiritual stuff and here's all physical things and they're completely separate. But spiritual things have to do with the spirit of God and the spirit of man. There has to be a connection between those things. And what we find churches doing quite often, if they don't have that, they don't have the Holy Spirit, it's like finding substitutes. Finding substitutes for the Spirit of God. And, and, and those who come to church and those who are seeking Christ quite often do the same. There's a real danger here that we find a substitute for the Spirit of Christ. But we, we, we make it about something else rather than uh, uh, the Spirit of Christ. Now, you might say, well, you know, we, we've, we've, got, we've got the Bible. That, that's, that's a physical thing, that's a material thing. Uh, but we've got the Bible, are you trying to say that the Bible isn't wor worth anything? That that's not what Christianity is about? No, I'm not saying that at all. As you, most of you know, I am sola scriptura. That means I take the Word of God as my absolute authority and matters of faith and practice. And so, of course, uh, the Bible uh, is important, it's central to what we do. Um, so, okay then, so the, the objection might be, well, what if you, if you have the Bible? What if you were to be an expert in the original languages? You go and study Hebrew and Greek, and then you can, you know, this idea that you have to have the Spirit to explain spiritual things. Wouldn't it be if you just studied the Bible, familiarised yourself with it, and remembered it, and you, you got to know the original languages so you could explain it, what it actually meant? Uh, uh, what if you devoted yourself, your whole life, to studying the scriptures, uh, to praying, to living uh, a good moral life, to, to being faithful, to attending every meeting, uh, and, being, and being faithful in your, your religious duties? Would that not be being a Christian? Is that not what it is? No. Um, what that is, is being a Pharisee. Listen, that's what they did, didn't they? they knew, you don't think the Pharisees knew Hebrew? Of course they did. They knew the original language of the Bible. They were experts in it. They, they, they studied it constantly. They memorized vast chunks of it, great swathes of it. The problem was that they trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. This was the spirit of them, wasn't it? Even though they had all this information, all this knowledge, even though they're experts in the scriptures, this was the spirit of them. Because they didn't have the spirit of God within them. So they expressed themselves in this way. They were, they were holier than thou, sanctimonious, weren't they? They were very faithful in their religious duties. They, they, they fasted twice in the week. They gave tithes of all that they possessed. 
They made long prayers, very impressive, long prayers. You would think they were very, very spiritual people. And what does Jesus say about them? They search the scriptures, don't they? Yeah? Search the scriptures, because in them you think you have eternal life. But what did Jesus say? But you will not come to me. So, so what was their substitute for God? What was their substitute for the Spirit? In a way, it was the Scriptures. <laughs> they say, well, you know, we've got the Scriptures, we, we, we know them really well, we meditate on them. Because they think that's going to give them eternal life. No, it's not. Even though the Apostle Paul tells us that the Scriptures make us wise unto salvation, you're not going to get the Spirit of God, you're not going to get that eternal life just because you read the Bible a lot, or even if you go and teach the Bible uh, and, and, and become uh, you know, a professor of theology, so what? Do you have the Spirit of God? That is, that is the difference. That what, you see, these things, what God is giving, can only come from God. It can only come from Christ, I'm going to say. You know the woman at the well? He comes to the well and he says, and Jesus says, you know, uh, Come to me and I'll give you the living water. Only Jesus can give you that. And again, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, uh, running down the idea of studying the Bible. You know, we're told you know, to study and to familiarize ourselves with this word. But it is not a substitute, you understand? It's not a substitute for having the Spirit of God. Uh, so these Pharisees, they're pretty impressive. They trust... Uh, they, they appear to be righteous. They fast twice a week. They give tithes of all they possess and make long prayers. Uh, and, and they search the scriptures. And they do not have the Spirit of God because all of this starts with God. John 4 24 says, God is a spirit. And it, it starts with, with God. So let's have a look at. How this starts with God, this, this becoming a Christian, this, this Christian spirituality. Um, and to do that, uh, we're going to step into the controversial. Uh, we're going to look at what they call the Ordo Salutis, the order of salvation. And um, this is the order of salvation as I understand it. Grace. Okay, the grace of God. Jesus said to his disciples, I chose you, you did not choose me. So it starts with God himself. God's grace, God's provenient grace. What does that mean? Provenient means, means uh, uh, preceding or it goes before anything else. It also means that, that God in his grace suspends your inability to believe on him. Because we come, come into this world corrupt. We come into this world uh, uh, in, in depravity. And yet God is able in his grace to suspend that inability to believe on him. And, and as, we, as that is suspended, uh, we are brought to repentance. That is to, to change our minds, to turn away from our sins and turn towards God. Uh, to have faith uh, in God, uh, justification to be to be pardoned, to be justified, uh, and to be regenerated by what or by whom? By the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, and to be sanctified, to be washed clean and set aside for holy use, and to be looking ahead to our glorification uh, when we will uh, be resurrected and will spend uh, eternity. With God, so that that is it, really. That is the the order of salvation, the order uh, sal salutis. But we'll see. It starts with God, and God is in every single aspect of this. And it is God that gives the grace that I might repent. It is God that gives the grace that I might have faith. Uh, it is God who justifies. It is God who regenerates. God who sanctifies. God who glorifies. Therefore, can I take credit for any of this? You see, an act of my own innate human will that I can just say, think I'll become a Christian. 
think I'll just walk into a church and uh, there you go, I'm a Christian now. Really? When did you receive the Spirit of God? Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be regenerated. And so don't let anyone tell you, you are a Christian, you've just not yet received the Holy Spirit. You know, I've never heard anyone say that to somebody. Oh yeah, you are, you are a Christian. Oh, of course you are. You've just not yet received the Holy Spirit. So you've got a second bit that's missing. You know, God, God didn't quite finish that off for you yet. But you are a Christian. Let's have a look what the Bible says about that. Um, Look at Romans 8, verse 9. In fact, I'll put it up here for you. Romans 8, verse 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Do you get that? You don't have the Spirit, you're not a Christian. Because that is the Spirit of God which transforms a person, which changes everything, sanctifies you, regenerates you, gives you the new life that Christ was promising, that everlasting life. If you don't have the Spirit, you don't have Christian spirituality, then, then forget it, you're not a Christian yet. You've, you've not been saved yet, you've not been regenerated yet. Because that is what defines being a Christian. Oh, but I believe in God, yeah. James says, the devils believe that there is one God. And they tremble. <clears throat> Are they saved? Are they Christians? No, they're still demons, they're still devils. Because it's not the fact you believe in God, I believe in a God. It's, now he says it's good that you believe there's one God. But that is not what defines a Christian. So this is this is plain, I think. It's all grace, it's all of God, it's all of Christ, it's all of his spirit. It is plain that Christianity is about spirit, it's about spiritual things. The Bible is a spiritual book. The Christian life is a spiritual walk, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That means we can't come to an understanding, to a knowledge of God or God's word unless we have his spirit abiding within us. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. I love these verses, they're so powerful. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of of this world. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So God frustrated the wise, He frustrated the academic, He frustrated the philosopher, because through their wisdom, through their worldly human wisdom, they couldn't know God. They applied all their human wisdom to God and never found Him. They applied all their knowledge, all, all everything that they learned. Highly qualified, clever men, clever women, and they couldn't find God. He eluded them. <coughs> but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world. That's you and me, by the way. We're the foolish. We're the weak things uh, of this world, of the world, to confound the things which are mighty. So that men would see it's by God's Spirit. It's by God's Spirit. It's not by, it's not by being really clever, really well educated, 
It's by God's Spirit. Doesn't mean we don't need to study and apply our mind to God's Word and God's Spirit. Paul says to Timothy, and therefore to us, study to show thyself approved unto God as a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of God. God. So we need to practice, we need to divide the Word of God to truly understand uh, what it applies to whom and to what. Um, we need to study to show ourselves approved. Being spiritual does not mean emptying your mind. It's not like these kind of transcendental meditations, empty your mind of everything. No, not at all. Not at all. But God is a spirit and they that worship Him, must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So that means applying your mind. It means submitting your mind. It means renewing your mind in the Spirit of God. That we might show ourselves approved. So it means that all these things applying your mind, submitting your mind, renewing your mind, that you might have the mind of Christ. Yes? That you might have the mind of Christ, that you might know and understand the mind of Christ concerning the Gospel. And this is what we read initially during the first scripture that I, I read to you. Did you notice how uh, uh, the phrase came up? We know. We know, there's, a, there's, there's an assurance about this. When I have the Spirit of God, I know. I know these things to be true. There is a deep, abiding conviction within me that such things are true. And it comes from God's Spirit. It doesn't come from my education or, or, or from how good a person I'm living. Remember, the Pharisees thought they were pretty righteous. But Jesus exposes their hypocrisy. He says, you're all hypocrites. Because on the outside, you're like whitewashed tombs, but inside you're full of dead men's bones, you're full of the corruption of sin, and the rottenness of sin, it's eating away at you inside, you've not done anything about that. You know, and you say that you stand for the prophets, but you don't, if you've been around in those days, you would have killed the prophets. So you've got that blood on your hands. You, you represent that group of people who don't have the Spirit of God. That religious group of people who, who will not submit to the Spirit of God, who seek to substitute the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of Antichrist. You know, the, the, the Antichrist, the term, doesn't just mean one who is against Christ. It means one who replaces Christ. Exactly. Yeah? So wherever you have that, think about the history of the church. No, thank you for that. Give me a bit more of a, a, a feedback like that. Yeah, nothing wrong with saying amen. Glory to God. This is the truth. This is the truth. You see it all through the history of the church. You see it in the Roman Catholic Church. You know, they exalt men to replace Christ. And that's why it's the church of the Antichrist. You see it the Pharisees. You know, they want to replace God with themselves, with the traditions of men. And wherever you see that, wherever you see Christ being replaced, Watch out, because that is, that is the spirit of Antichrist. Antichrist is a spiritual thing, I'll quote William Tyndale. Antichrist is a spiritual thing. It's a spirit at work within the enemies of God. And so you cannot substitute the spirit of God, because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. But it has to be in you. The spirit of God has to be in you for you to say that and for it to mean something. And it, this is Christian spirituality. It's having the Spirit of God within you and, and you know, allowing His Spirit to lead, allowing His Spirit to have, have dominion in your life. In Galatians 6, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says something that I have always found very interesting. And he, he's talking about how to deal with brethren, with other Christians. Who, who are overtaken in a fault, okay? They, 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 they struggle with something, they've been overtaken with something, and they made a mistake. It could be a sin, yeah, it could be a sin. Okay, it's how do you deal with somebody who's in that position? How do you minister to them? Should you even minister to them? Is it not like the job of the pastor? 
But what is so revealing here in Galatians 6 verse 1 is that Paul says, You who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. You who are spiritual. You who are spiritual literally means you whose lives are governed by the spirit. Okay? So, not you who have been to Bible college, not you who have very professional and responsible jobs in the outside world, not you who have very dominant personalities, but you who are spiritual, you whose lives are under the dominion of the Spirit of God, who are allowing God to work through you, and do you notice he says, in a spirit of meekness, humility. Why? Because meekness, humility, love, patience are the fruit of the Spirit. That is the fruit of the Spirit in your life. That is Christian spirituality. Is that you have these things, that you're patient, that you're loving, that you are, you are slow to speak, that you are, you are humble, you have the meekness that Christ himself had. The meek, the humble, the spiritual, God entrusts to bring other believers back, to restore them to himself. They are the ones that God trusts, the spiritual. Not the ones who think they're spiritual, not the ones who have been taught by men how to appear spiritual, but those who genuinely have the spirit of God can restore brothers and sisters in Christ. They have that ministry. They can build them up, they can help them, they can bring them back in a spirit of meanness. I want to just finish this morning with the words uh, of a hymn by, by Charles Wesley. And, uh, I am not familiar really with his hymn, but the words just kind of uh, uh, struck me. God, through the Spirit, we shall know if thou within us shine and sound with all the saints below the depths of love divine. Do you know what it is to sound the depths? So used to do is it's a nautical term when the ship's going through the water and they lower a weight down to see how deep is this water. And if it hits a rock, you know it's not very deep. But the depths of love divine goes on forever and ever. We're sounding the depths. We're finding out how deep is this love of God. It just goes on and on and on. It's like lowering that weight down and it's, it's, and it's still going. That's how deep God's love is for us. That's the kind of love that I should have for my brothers and sisters in Christ. That is what my Christian spirituality should be able to be measured in, is with that depth. It, it's about love. Yes, that's why God is love. If you want to measure spirituality, if you could do such a thing, then you would be measuring the amount, the depth of the love of God that you have allowed into your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless it to us this morning. We want to pray that you would be exalted, not just in this place, but in our hearts and in our minds as well. In Jesus' name.